Hello everybody, welcome back. Today we're doing another Strengths and Materials video. And in this video, we're gonna be covering a pretty simple concept, which is indeterminate torque loaded members. The reason that I say it's simple is because we've already covered the basics of what is in store for a topic like this. The problem is gonna be a bit tricky, but the understanding of the theory really isn't too bad. So why do I say it's simple? The first thing we need to recall is the difference between determinate versus indeterminate. And we understand where this difference comes from when we look at our equilibrium equations. Now, looking back for any problem that we did in the past for uh, rigid members, we recall that we are using these three equilibrium equations, summation of forces at y, at x, and the moment in order to determine unknowns in the problem. However, when these equations are not enough, we deem the member as indeterminate. And it's pretty much as simple as that. The only difference now is that when we're looking at a torque loaded member, we have to consider moment, the summation of moment at zero. And why do I say that? It's because torque is pretty much just a fancy moment. As I've discussed before, the only difference is we are now acting about the longitudinal axis. So in these cases, if we had unknown torques applied or the amount of unknowns uh, being applied to our system, is higher than the amount of equations we have to solve for them, then we have to employ some different tactics in order to solve the problems. Now the first tactic or uh, condition, uh, otherwise known as a condition of compatibility, is gonna be as follows. Uh, we know that in a fixed system, which is where uh, indeterminate torque loaded systems are gonna be occurring most frequently for your problems, the angle of twist at either end, if we take a applied torque and then look at the side profile with respect to a reference plane along that longitudinal axis, we can see that at both ends, the angle of twist is going to equal zero because it is locked in place by the support condition. Since it's fixed, it is totally locking it from twisting. And as you move further and further down the axis or the longitudinal line, we are actually creating a bigger distance between that initial position of the plane and the final position. Now that we understand that, we can confidently say that the angle of twist at uh, point B is going to be equal to the angle of twist at point A, and they're both going to equal zero in the fixed fixed case. Now we also need to remember that because of the angle of twist formula being cumulative, as we work down the length of the member, the influence of each external torque applied uh, at any given length must cumulatively satisfy, uh, cumulatively satisfy <laughs> the angle of twist condition. So what that means is pretty much no matter what happens uh, along the length, these two angles must equal zero in that fixed case. Now that we have this written down, let's work in the problem and see what's going on here. All right, so now let's hop into this problem. Uh, what it wants us to look at is a composite shaft, which consists of a midsection that includes the one inch diameter solid shaft and two that is welded to rigid flanges at A, B. So all that means is that this shaft is running all the way from C to D. And this tube is around the shaft at A, B, welded at points A and point B, such that they're acting together. Now it wants us to neglect the thickness of the flanges and to determine the angle of twist of NC of the shaft relative to ND. That's gonna be important later. The shaft is subject to a torque of 800 pounds per foot and the material is A36 steel. Now I'm gonna preface this problem before I even start solving it because there are things that are different from the theory that I explained and I'm gonna make it super simple. This problem is unique because we have an indeterminate torque loaded member. However, the ends are not fixed. So right away, this rule where theta at the ends has to equal zero is not the case anymore. However, the rule is gonna slightly change. Now we're gonna be looking at the angle at C and the angle at D or the angle of twist is gonna be exactly the same, but do not equal zero. And that's because you have an equal and opposite torque being applied at both ends with a symmetrical system. Just thinking about that logically, we're gonna have an equal angle at both ends. 
So let's just write that down as one of our first points of understanding for this problem. So theta c is going to equal to theta d. But we are still looking at an indeterminate torque load member because we have a very similar situation where we have two unknown internal torques developing in section AB. But why is that? Uh, well, normally you'd, you'd look at a problem like this and say, well, the system's in equilibrium. You have equal and opposite torque acting uh, at the same magnitude, right? So why is it not in equilibrium? Well, you're 100% right in saying that it is in equilibrium because this 800 pound torque is going to be acting throughout the entire system. So here along that entire length, we have 800 pounds foot per foot. But where things become tricky is finding the angle of twist because we no longer have a uniform shaft uh, along the entire length. And the internal torque being developed in this section of the shaft is going to be different from CA and BD. As we know, the angle of twist, which is up here, is influenced by the polar moment of inertia, which is pretty much a geometric property based on the radius of our shaft. And at this center part, we have a different section. We have the tube and we have the shaft, where in this point, we only have the shaft. So in order to determine our ultimate goal, which is to get the angle of twist at C with respect to D, for the shaft, we have to look at AB and the angle developed in the shaft. But the angle in the shaft has to be equal to the angle that's created inside of the tube as well. That's the trick to this problem. If you think about this logically, as we work down the shaft and get to this point, because this is welded together, this whole section AB is going to act integrally, meaning that as you twist, the angle developed in the shaft section will equal that of the angle in the tube as well. So that is one of our first conditions where we need to understand that the angle of twist in the shaft is going to equal the angle of twist in the tube. And now, we also need to understand another thing about this problem is that section AB needs to maintain equilibrium. We know that this entire uh, length of the member is going to have 800 pounds per foot of torque applied. But if we look internally at the torques developed in the shaft and the tube, those torques have to cumulatively combine in order to equal 800. So we now know that this section AB has to be the addition of the torque at the shaft and the torque developed at the tube. And using this, we can write down a simple equilibrium equation where in order to bring that back to equilibrium, which is zero, we are going to be looking at the starting torque, which is 800, and then taking away the internal torques that are developed shaft two. To start solving this problem, we're going to look at this first relationship that we have here. We're just going to write it in terms of the formula that we understand. So if we are looking at the angle of twist that's developing for this entire length AB for the shaft only, it has to equal that of the tube as well. So let's write that down in a uh, formula. So the torque developed in the shaft times the length AB over the shear modulus times the polar moment of inertia for the shaft will equal to the same exact angle of twist for the tube. So we're just replacing the subscript for these variables for tube instead of shaft. All right, so now we can isolate for the torque in the shaft and use that in this formula here in order to solve for the unknowns, okay? So now rearranging this formula, we're gonna be left with something that looks like this, where we have TS, where the torque in the shaft is gonna to equal to torque in the tube times the polar moment inertia of the shaft 
over the polar moment of inertia of the tube because these are constant and canceling and the lengths are constant and canceling. So now I can start plugging in values for that. So TS is going to equal to TT and the polar moment of inertia formula. So on the top we have for the shaft. The diameter of the shaft is going to be 1 inch. Our formula uses radius, so we're going to have to divide that by 2. So we're taking 0.5 to the power of 4. And that's it for the top. Now for the bottom, we have to consider the tube. And the tube is a hollow, uh, hollow pipe. So we're going to have something that looks like this, where we have pi over 2. And we're taking the outside radius minus the inside radius, or the hollow part. So we're going to have 3 divided by 2, which is 1.5 to the 4, subtracting 1.25 to the 4. And solving that, we're going to be left with Ts is equal to 0 0.0238 Tt. Now, this is going to look a bit messy, bringing this back to our relationship up here, we can actually solve for TT. So if we replace TS for TT here and bring everything over to solve for TT, we're going to be left with something that looks like this, where we have 800 over 1.0238, leaving us with TT equal to 781. 0.4 pounds per foot. Hopefully you guys can see that. Now what can we do with this information? Now we can actually go ahead and start solving uh, for Ts because we know that based on this equilibrium equation it has to be the takeaway from 800. So Ts is going to equal either 800 minus this or you can plug this right back into this equation, where Ts is going to be equal to 18.6 pounds per foot. Now we can finally solve for the angle of twist at C with respect to D. And we know what that formula is going to look like. What we have starting at C and working this way, we have theta C over A plus theta a over b, but only for the shaft, because that's what the problem is calling for, and theta b over d. Now it's just simple plug and jug, uh, and I'll skip to the end answer for you guys. All right, so now this is the final solution to the problem. Just to explain a couple things here, uh, I brought out the constants in this problem, which are the shear modulus and the shaft's polar moment of inertia. So we just brought that to the outside, and we have 12 squared on the top here to convert our pounds per foot to pounds per inch and our foot to inch, which is why this is out here, because it needs to apply to each of these individual terms for CA, AB, and BD. Uh, just to explain some minor things as well, we are only taking the torque at AB, which is acting in the shaft. All right, that's that's the whole trick to this problem. And then CA and BD are pretty simple, as we've done before, just taking that uh, torque applied to the entire system, which is that 800, because it is completely taken by solely the shaft at these two sections. Plugging all that in, you're left with this final answer with the angle of twist at NC with respect to D for the shaft of 0 0.1085 radians. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, I hope I explained everything well enough, and uh, I'll see you in the next one.